Um, we're going to be in Revelation chapter 14 uh, this morning. Uh, it was great to be away last week, but so thankful to be back with you guys uh, and just back in what I really consider to be uh, a place of refuge. You know, we come here each Sunday morning in the midst of all of the different things that have happened to us personally in our week and that have happened uh, again politically and socially and economically and globally in the week. But ultimately, this is a place where we come to find refuge and to just take a moment of pause and experience a moment of peace and of rest and just allow the Lord to refresh and renew us in our spirits. And um, so we're counting on him to do that today. And I hope that we'll see that uh, he will do that today uh, through our text. So let's pray and just ask the Lord really to bless our time uh, in the word. So, Father, we do thank you so much for this opportunity, Lord, this time in this place of refuge that you have provided to us, Lord. We thank you um, so much for your word, which you've given to us, Lord, to encourage us and to assure us of your presence, Lord, even in these um, just seemingly overwhelming and inexplicable situations, Lord. We know that you are not surprised, Lord. We know that you're at work and we know that you will continue to be sovereign, Lord, just ruling and reigning from your throne. And so we ask for your intervention in so many of these different situations, Lord. We pray this morning just for us here, Lord, that you would uh, use this time to refresh us, to prepare us for the work that you have before us. Lord, we pray that you'd minister to each one of us, Lord, those things that uh, only you know, Lord, speak to those places in our hearts that you know need to be spoken to. And so we, we do pray, Lord, as we do each and every week, that you would give us ears to hear what your spirit would say to your church. And we ask it, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. As I said, it is good to be back with you guys. It's good to be back in this book with you guys because, uh, my apologies, we left off in kind of a precarious place last time. And, you know, we're, we're still stopped here, right? We're kind of paused in the middle of the book of Revelation. We're paused chronologically in the middle of the tribulation, three and a half years into that seven-year period, uh, Daniel's 70th week. We've seen the first two sets of three judgments, those are kind of in the rear view, um, but we've paused, remember, in chapters 10 through 14 in what we've called so the longest sort of parenthetical passage in the book. And we've talked about the fact that I believe that the Spirit placed it right here in the middle of the book at the middle point of the tribulation. Um, the Lord's just kind of taking a, a little time out, if you will, to provide us with some background information to all of the different things that we see happening during this period. And just very quickly, we remember a couple weeks back with chapter 12, we started what is really kind of a section within a section. Remember, chapters 12 and 13 together presented us with some of the very key characters that we would see and we've been watching in this whole end times drama. We saw the woman Israel. We saw the male child Jesus, right? The Messiah of Israel, the coming king of the world. We met Michael, the archangel. We were given a bunch of detail about a character that we're all too familiar with, Satan, right? The dragon. We saw the explanation, if you will, of how Lucifer, the shining star, became Satan, the adversary and the accuser, and how he's just on this continued mission to thwart the people of God as well as the purposes of God. And then last time, we moved into chapter 13, and we kind of continued right along those same lines, having looked at Satan... We got a glimpse last time of the remaining two members of what we called kind of this unholy trinity, right? We were introduced to the two beasts, and these were these two beasts that are going to do the bidding, if you will, of the dragon 
in these last days. And remember, the two beasts aren't animals, but they're men who will come on the world scene and from the perspective of heaven and from their actions, they'll act more like animals than humans. We saw the Antichrist, the beast from the sea, right? This coming world political ruler um, who'll be a man, but clearly he will be energized from hell. He'll receive all of the power that he has, it says, from Satan. We saw that he'll be possessed by Satan. Just in the same way that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh, the Antichrist at that point during the tribulation, probably after that assassination attempt, Satan will enter him and he will be literally Satan in human form. Um, you know, we saw this incredible rise he's going to have to this, not just the, the ruler of this revived Roman Empire, but he'll become really a world dictator. And he's going to do that, we saw, with the help of the second beast, right, the beast from the land, the false prophet, right, the final member of our satanic trinity, if you will, Satan here counterfeiting the father, the beast or the antichrist, the imitation of the son and the savior, and the false prophet, a counterfeit, if you will, for the Holy Spirit. Because in the same way that the Holy Spirit's ministry is to point people to Jesus Christ, the false prophet will point people to the antichrist and actually compel them to worship him. You remember as we finished off in our text last time we were together, the, it's the false prophet that will compel people by requiring them to receive the mark of the beast either on their right hand or on their forehead. And that really is a sign of their worship of and their allegiance to the beast, right? It's the only thing that will allow them to buy or to sell, you know, to acquire the necessities of daily life. It's the only way they'll be able to participate in what will be this one world economic commercial system. You could think of it almost like kind of some sort of a passport, if you will, that might be required in order to do certain things and to go certain places. All in all, as we were looking at all of this, at the end of chapter 13, things were looking just a bit bleak, I think. You know, we saw this complete survey of these coming characters of evil. And admittedly, at the end of chapter 13, one could be a little bit discouraged about uh, the end times. But then we have chapter 14, right? So our text today which in a lot of ways we're going to see is really a chapter all about contrasts. You know, it presents us with God's answer to all of this evil that we've been seeing. It gives us a glimpse in that same sort of a very panoramic kind of a way. It gives us a glimpse of the closing up of this tribulation period from the perspective of heaven and also those final preparations for the ushering in of the kingdom of Jesus. So I called it the, a view of the end from heaven's perspective. It's almost like we've seen Satan's side. Now we're going to have a look at the winning side. And it begins first with this, this picture of those who didn't receive the mark of the beast, but rather received the mark of of the Father. So in the first five verses of Revelation chapter 14, we have this victorious vision of the faithful. It says in verse 1, it says, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his Father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. And they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among them 
being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now you might remember back in chapter 13 with the rise of the Antichrist as he would become this dictator over all the world. Remember the people of the world asked this important question. In verse 4 of chapter 13, they asked, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Right, who can stand up against this guy? And well, here's the answer. It's these 144,000 guys. Now, this is the very same group that we looked at back in chapter 7, and you remember they were sealed at the beginning of the tribulation by the Father to be protected during the tribulation. And now here they are pictured for us at the end of the tribulation. So this vision looks ahead to the triumph of those 144,000 who are still very much alive at the time of the return of Jesus from heaven to the earth. And just this picture would be such a great encouragement. It will become a great encouragement to those who will be suffering persecution during this tribulation period. It would have been a great encouragement to all of those who were suffering back in John's day, right? To all of those faithful believers who either are suffering now or, or have suffered or will suffer throughout history because this picture is evidence that God will continue to sustain and protect those who continue to be faithful to him. Every single one of them. And you guys I know will forgive me for pointing out the obvious because I seem to do it every week, but remember back in chapter 7 when we first met these guys Remember John wrote in Revelation chapter 7, verse 4, he says, I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all of the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. And then, remember we read as he went through 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel for a total of 144,000 who were sealed and they were set apart for that very special ministry, right? Remember, to go throughout the world proclaiming the gospel. Of course, that would have made them special targets, right, of the Antichrist's persecution. And so here we are with this picture at the end of the tribulation, and notice we don't see 143,999 witnesses, do we? We see 144 thousand. In other words, each and every one of them, they will all make it through. And don't miss this because John very clearly showed us, shows us that their preservation in a sense came as a result of their separation, right? They had been set, set apart to God. No matter how wicked the world might become, God always has his faithful people. The, the 144,000, they didn't belong to the earth. John tells us they had been redeemed out of the earth. And Paul would also write sort of the same idea to the Philippians. He talks about the fact that they didn't set their minds on earthly things because their citizenship was actually in heaven. Now, we as believers today, the church, we don't belong to this very special group in a, in a prophetic sense, but like them, we have also been redeemed in an eternal and a very practical sense. We are no longer part of this world system, right? Jesus himself said, they are not of the world, speaking of us, he says, just as I am not of the world. And because of that, our, our lives should reflect some of these very same characteristics that we see reflected of these 144,000 believers who've been redeemed out of the world. Now, with that said, I want to clarify something. The phrase there that says they were not defiled with women doesn't imply that marriage somehow is evil, 
right? Or that sex within marriage is evil because it's not. The, it says in Hebrews 13 that marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. Now, it may simply, as many suggest, it may suggest that these 144,000 Jewish men were unmarried Jewish men. But I think potentially it suggests perhaps something that's even more significant than that. Because in the Bible, so often when we see images of physical sexual fornication or physical adultery, those very often are there intended to be pictures of spiritual idolatry. In Exodus chapter 34, the Lord declared this to his people. He said, you shall worship no other God lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and they play the harlot with their gods and make sacrifice to their gods and one of them invites you and you eat of his sacrifice and you take of his daughters for your sons and his daughters play the harlot with their gods and make your sons play the harlot with their gods. So in, in a spiritual sense, much more simply, speaking of these 144,000, it pictures a group of those who remain true to the living God in a spiritual sense. Perhaps virgins physically as well, but certainly undefiled spiritually. These are believers who would not bow down to the world system even in order to get what they wanted, right? Who even to their own harm kept themselves pure and kept themselves undefiled by the world. This is a time when most of the population will bow down to the image of the beast and yet the 144,000 are going to be faithful to the true and living God. It's a time when others are going to lie to get whatever it is that they need, but the 144,000 specifically, it says, they're without guile or blemish. And we see that God is going to carry them through in a very special way. Notice what it says there in verse 3. It says that they will sing a new song before the throne before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. Now, I love this, and I think it's super significant. They will sing a song praising the Lord for his protection that no one else, because they went through what no one else did in a way that no one else did. Notice specifically, the creation can't sing this song, right? The four living creatures. The church can't sing this song, right? Represented there by the elders. Only these saints can sing this song in this way because only they made it through the tribulation the way that they did. And can I encourage you that even though we might not be able to sing their song, we each have our own song, don't we? We each have our own song of God's deliverance and of his faithfulness that we alone can sing based on what it is that he has brought us through. See, they alone could sing of what they were able to see the Father do on their behalf in the time of their tribulation, and it produced this song that welled up from their hearts. And God's intention is that those times of deep tribulation in our lives would produce a similar song. Now, I know that there are some of you in this body who don't feel much like singing right now. And I know because you are stuck in the middle of a terrible time of trial. But I think that what the 144,000 here at the beginning of chapter 14, I think that what their new song reminds us is that one day we will sing our own song of deliverance, especially as we stay true to the Father, especially as we stay undefiled by this wicked world system that's getting wickeder and wickeder all around us, especially as we continue, as it says there, of them to follow the Lamb wherever He goes. And especially, I think, as we can just remember that we are on 
the winning side. And as we continue on in the rest of this chapter this morning, we're going to see a series of these pictures that are now given to John to remind us, I think, of that reality. We just saw this contrast between those who received the mark of the beast and those who received the mark of the father. Now, in verses 6 through 13, we're going to look at three angels with three warnings. Right, three separate warnings given by three separate angels about the wicked world system and the dangers of following after it and its satanic rulers. And the very first one we see, this first angel, is this angel that's preaching the gospel and pointing people away from the system of Satan and toward God's world system. Look what it says in verse 6. John says, then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. Now today... God uses people, doesn't he, to proclaim his message. But during this final time of judgment, he will call in some reinforcements and ultimately he will use angels as well. And I love this this concept here because think about all during this seven-year period, the 144,000 have been kind of like this infantry of evangelism, but now God calls in the air support, right? And it's the angels. And so people will often ask the question, they say, come on, man, is this, are we supposed to believe this is a literal angel? And the answer is, well, why wouldn't it be? Why couldn't it be? And many people see the final fulfillment of the promise that Jesus made in Matthew 24, 14, where he said that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations And then, he says, the end will come. Understand, this is going to be an unprecedented period in human history. And why wouldn't we expect God to do unprecedented things to get the gospel out to the entire planet, right? Every tongue and tribe and nation. Right? While the nations are there fearing the beast and giving honor to him, here this heavenly messenger is going to warn them to fear God, right? to honor God and to honor him alone. It's a reminder that God is the creator and he alone deserves to be worshipped. That's the gospel. Now, it may not be the gospel message sort of that we're accustomed to, but that's the gospel nonetheless in its simplest form. In a way, this is a return to the message of Romans chapter 1. We think about Paul's argument. It's what Bible students call a natural theology. right? In Romans chapter 1, verse 20, Paul writes that since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes are clearly seen. Basically, what Paul's saying is that the creation was created to reveal the creator. All of creation, everything that we see around us, bears witness to God's existence as well as to his power and to his wisdom and to his sovereignty and his right alone to rule over the universe. The lie of Satan right now, the very same lie that the beast will use then, is to convince people that Satan's in charge of this world, or better yet, to convince people in such a subtle way that we are in charge of this world, and that somehow we are in charge of our own destiny, completely independent of God. And so this is this message of this angel by the grace of God calling men kind of back to basics, right? That God's the creator, we need to worship and we need to serve him alone. It's going to be God's 
last call, if you will. Last call to the people that some might turn back to him. And yet we know there will be so many who at that point will have fully embraced Satan's system and his lies that now we're going to see a second angel come in basically to tell these people that they are standing on unstable ground. Because here this next angel is going to proclaim the final ultimate fall of Satan's current wicked world system. Look at what it says in verse 8. It says that another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now we're going to spend plenty of time in chapter 17 and 18 seeing these described more, more fully, but there are two different Babylons that are described in the book of Revelation. There's commercial Babylon and there's religious Babylon, right? That oppressive economic system and the false religious system, both of which our enemy Satan has carefully constructed and is currently to turn people away from the Lord. Now, we're going to talk, as I said, way more about this in more detail in the coming weeks. But suffice to say, to say for now, that what we see for now is that it doesn't end well for the people who choose to follow this path. Because here we see that God's wrath is going to be poured out on this whole system, which has led so many into immorality. And he's going to destroy it completely. There will come a point where God will bring to an end these things that Satan has used so long to intoxicate so many individuals into following him. And here's this another angel of warning sent in grace to, to announce to those who are taking part in and who are trusting in this current system that they're finally going to find that their whole system has collapsed collapsed like a house of cards. And I think that for us as believers, we have this choice that's ahead of us each and every single day. And that's a choice whether or not to buy into this current system, which the Bible says is very temporary, or to continue to seek after the kingdom of God and involve ourselves in this system of God that we know is eternal and that it's everlasting. We look around, it's not hard to see that by design, all of the comforts and the pleasures of the world can be so intoxicating to us. And what they really do is they dull our senses. They dull our senses to the spiritual realities of the things that really matter. And they shift our focus, sometimes almost imperceptibly, but they ultimately shift our focus from following Jesus, the one who truly matters, and we start instead to follow this sorry substitute for Jesus. And so we see this next, now we have the third angel that's going to come, and now we've had this warning about the world system and which one should we should be seeking. Now this third angel is going to give us a warning about which ruler we should be following. Look at verse 9. It says, then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest, day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Now remember when we said that no one would take the mark of the beast without knowing exactly what it was they were doing. We even said that an angel would appear flying through the heavens to warn people not to take the mark. Well, here it is. So this is that angel, and his message seems to be crystal clear. 
For all of those who will be sort of deciding about whether to follow the beast, here God provides this unmistakable warning that the easy way is really the hard way. And that to just go along with the flow really means to go away from God and that the consequences for that choice are almost unimaginable. And yet I want us to see that even in this message of seemingly harsh judgment, I think that we see grace. Because look there at verse 9 and understand that in the original Greek, what the warning really reads is that if any man continues to worship the beast, the verb form there is one of a continued action. And the sense here is that even at this late time, there is still opportunity for repentance and for salvation. But I think the message is equally clear that for those who refuse to repent, for those who refuse God's mercy, that there are then two different judgments that await them. There's one here on earth and there's one that lasts for all eternity. In the Bible, when you see that phrase, drinking the cup, it's very often used as an image of coming judgment. And what we're soon going to see is that this last round of God's judgments that are going to be poured out on mankind are the bowls or the cups of wrath poured out from heaven in their full strength, as it says there in verse 10. In other words, this time... These judgments are not going to be mixed with mercy as we've seen in the past. Because to refuse the mercy of God when it's offered is to suffer the judgment of God when it comes. First here on earth, and then following that earthly wrath, the angel's very clear that those who reject the grace of God, those who refuse to be reconciled to God, are going to face an eternity both of torment and of separation from God. Now, this is an admittedly difficult passage. And yet the truth is that those people who suggest that either hell is not a literal place or that it won't last for eternity, those people simply have not read the Bible. We're here where it says in verse 11 that the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. Literally, in the original language, it says that the smoke of their torment ascends into the ages of ages. And Greek language experts tell us that that is the strongest expression of eternity of which the Greek is capable. The fact is, did you know that Jesus taught more on the subject of hell than he did on the subject of heaven. And he did that as a warning so that people wouldn't end up there. Then he gave his life as he hung on the cross of Calvary so that no one would ever have to spend eternity there. Then he sent his spirit out into the world to work through us as the church as we proclaimed the good news of the gospel for the next 2,000 plus years. And if that still wasn't enough, here at the very end of the tribulation before he finally returns to earth, he's gonna send three angels flying through the, through the sky first announcing to people that they should turn to God, then warning them that this wicked system in which they are putting their trust is about to fall, and then pleading with them not to take the mark of the beast so they don't suffer the same fate of this eternity separated from the true and living God. So often, people will get so upset by these kinds of images like fire and brimstone and smoke. And they ask, how can a God of love actually send someone to suffer eternal torment? Now, it's a big subject that we're not going to solve this morning. But just quickly, from a philosophical perspective, I think we could rightly argue that God doesn't send anyone to hell. He simply allows them to choose whether or not they want to accept or reject him. 
and then he confirms their choice for them. God will always honor our autonomy. He will never force, he will not you know, force our loyalty or our surrender, but there are consequences for the choices that we make. And C.S. Lewis, who's you know, a Christian apologist and kind of a, a Christian philosopher, in his classic work called The Great Divorce, he writes this. He says, there are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. All that are in hell, choose it, he says. So that's kind of a quick snapshot of one part of the sort of philosophical perspective. Now, from a judicial perspective, we all need to keep in mind God is loving, but God's love is a holy love, and it's a righteous love, and it's a just love, because the Bible says that he himself is holiness. He is justice. He is righteousness. And therefore, he can only act justly and righteously in the way that he deals with the sin and the rebellion of men and women. There has to be a price paid for sin or he wouldn't be just. He wouldn't be righteous because the scales would be off. And so the real question is how can a God of justice allow a rebellious sinner in his presence? And of course, the answer to that question is it's his grace. Right? It's his mercy and it's the cross of Jesus Christ where he gave his life as a sacrifice on behalf of us, for his life, for our life. And this is exactly what John continues on now in verse 12. Watch the, so having just described kind of these eternal consequences of those who follow after the beast, in verse 12 he says that here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Verse 13, then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. So under the inspiration of the spirit, here John very clearly is contrasting the rest for those who accept forgiveness found in Jesus and the continual torment of those who have rejected that offer of forgiveness, right? That rest that comes through this patient endurance and faithfulness to God and to his word, right? Those who keep the commandments of God and place their faith, it says, in Jesus Christ. And we can only imagine the kind of comfort and courage that this very passage is going to give to the embattled, persecuted saints right in the midst of the tribulation, right? Who are risking their lives literally because they're taking a faithful stand for Jesus. We can only imagine the way that it is bringing comfort even this moment to believers in Afghanistan or believers in any other place where they're suffering persecution for their faith because the upshot is that even their death is going to bring them rest. That's the kind of perspective that's really informed by eternity. And what the Bible is basically saying here is blessed are those who die after they become believers during the tribulation because their death is going to bring them rest from the hell on earth that's going on all around them. And clearly the heart of God is to encourage his people in every age to be steadfast in times of trial and to be focused on that blessed rest and that great reward that awaits each and every one of us in eternity. And this is that kind of an eternal promise that enables persecuted believers in the most unbelievable situations. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 
Paul says that God will give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So it is far better right, to reign with Christ forever than to reign with the Antichrist for just a few short years. It is far better to endure persecution patiently now than to escape it temporarily, but then to suffer that same torment throughout all of eternity. So you can see this is a chapter of choices and, and contrasts, right, between two different kingdoms and two different rulers and two different eternities. And these contrasts and these choices are unmistakably clear. And for those who ignore the warnings, the coming judgment is certain. And that's what we see now just in the balance of the chapter. We've seen these three angels with their three warnings. Now we're going to three, see three more angels with two more pictures, right? They're going to provide us with um, two aspects of the coming harvest at the end of the age. Verse 14 says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was Reaped. So John sees Jesus right, on a white cloud coming with a sickle, and many Bible students see in this image this fulfillment of the promise of Jesus in the parable of the tares, Matthew chapter 13, when he declared that it's at the time of the end of the age that the wicked are going to be separated from the just. That he's going to gather the wheat into the storehouse, but he's going to burn up the tares with unquenchable fire. Remember that when Jesus came the first time in the flesh, he came as a sower of the seed. And yet people rejected that seed of the word of God, and instead they received the lies of Satan. So now pictured here at his second coming, this time Jesus has to come as a reaper, right? Bringing judgment now to the world. The very same one who once hung on Calvary's cross because he was judged by the wicked is the one who's coming to execute this judgment upon the wicked. Right? Jesus is going to come back to the world that crucified him, but he's going to gather together for his kingdom out of all of the tongues and tribes and nations all of those who have accepted his message of forgiveness and grace, but for all who rejected the gospel, they now have to be given over to final judgment, which John now pictures next in another image of the harvest, but now it's not the harvest of the grain, it's the harvest of the grapes, which we believe anticipates the final scene of God's judgment of the world. It says in verse 17, then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, who had power over fire. And he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. Now what in the world is going on here? 
Well, when we look around the scriptures, right, we go back to the Old Testament, we find that the grape harvest is often a very particular picture of judgment. And in fact, it's the exact picture that's used by the prophet Joel in chapter 3 of his prophecy, which specifically anticipates the day of the Lord, right? That coming time of the final judgment that we're looking at right here. In Joel chapter 3, verse 13, he says, put in the sickle, well, the Lord says, put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down, for the winepress is full, the vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. So the idea here of trampling on the grapes in the process of the making of wine, it's used here as this picture of the crushing judgment that's about to come because the vine was overdue for harvest. Interesting, the actual sense of that word, look in verse 18 where it says that it's fully ripe. The literal sense of that is actually that it's overripe. And in fact, interestingly, it, the ancient Greek word for ripe that describes the wheat up in verse 15 has that exact same sense of being overripe to the point of becoming dry or withered. And the idea in both of these pictures is that God will judge the earth, but only when it becomes overripe for his judgment. God is not rushing into judgment the way that most of us would. I wouldn't have put up with things quite as long as God has put up with things. But he's long-suffering, right? He's patiently waiting, really until the crops themselves, right, both the wheat and the vine, but God's going to wait till the crops themselves demand to be harvested. Especially that invasive damaging vine like the vine of the earth that we see here. In actuality, in the scriptures, there are three different vines that we see spoken of. Israel was said to be God's vine that he planted in the land to bear fruit unto him. But the nation failed God, became this overgrown wild vine and had to be cut down. You can look in Psalm 80 and Isaiah 5 and Matthew 21 references some of these things. Now, today, Jesus says that he is what? He's the true vine. And he says that we as believers are each individual branches in him, and that we're connected to him, and that we receive our life from him, right? John chapter 15. But the world system that Satan has currently set up is also a vine. That's the vine of the earth that we see here in verse 18 in direct contrast to Jesus who is the heavenly vine. And that vine, right, the vine of the earth, it is already overripe for God's judgment. Right, that wicked vine Babylon, right, whose wicked wine, right, has intoxicated people and has been controlling them, will one day be cut down and will finally be fully destroyed. It says there, in the winepress of the wrath of God. Now, when will this happen? I'm so glad that you asked, right? Because that very same prophetic passage in Joel chapter 3 gives us the context of this whole judgment. If you back up just a few verses, starting off in verse 9, I'm going to edit this out a little bit. The Lord says this. He says, Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble and come, all you nations, and gather together all around, and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, go down, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. He says, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. 
For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon will grow dark and the stars will diminish their brightness. The Lord also will roar from Zion and utter his voice from Jerusalem. The heavens and the earth will shake. So this prophecy is a picture not of a movie about the future with Bruce Willis called Armageddon. It's a picture of the battle of Armageddon, right? A picture of the final world battle. When all the armies of the world are going to gather together, they're going to be lured to the valley of Megiddo at the foot of Mount Megiddo in Israel, some 60 miles north of the city of Jerusalem or outside the city, just as we read here in verse 20, they're going to be lured there by the Antichrist in a final attempt to muster all of the military might he can to finally annihilate the people of God, only to find themselves to be annihilated by the Son of God as Jesus Christ returns to the earth at his second coming during this battle. And both in the prophecy that we read from Joel, as well as the text here from John, there is this graphic picture of what will be a great slaughter. A slaughter like has never been before. The Holy Spirit uses this graphic language, especially there in verse 20, he describes this river of blood, right? Four feet deep, 200 miles long. It says blood came out of the wine press up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. Now, whether these are literal measurements or whether they're figurative imagery, we can talk about afterwards on the patio. Either way, what we have here is a tremendous amount of death and carnage in which blood is spattered perhaps as high as the, the bridles of horses. Now, what I think is interesting is that 200 miles or 1,600 furlongs is not by coincidence, it's the actual length of the promised land as originally promised by God to Abraham. So understanding that, the picture we have here is that the entire length of the Holy Land is drenched in blood. Now, all in all, right, all of this, all of this vivid, powerful language, right, both in the images of the harvest, simply show us, I think, how thoroughly complete this final judgment of God is going to be. It also shows us just how easily that world system and the kingdom of Satan is going to fall. So Revelation chapter 14 is the perfect answer to Revelation chapter 13. At the end of chapter 13, it almost seemed like Satan and his Antichrist might win, but chapter 14 is a vivid reminder of who is really triumphant and who is really powerful and who is really in control. Right? It's God, and it's his Messiah, and it's his people. It's not Satan, it's not his false Messiah, and it's not his deluded followers. Now, for some of you, you might be right in the middle of a chapter 13 kind of a season in your own life. And I know some of you who truly are, but take heart because chapter 14 is just a page turn away. Okay, maybe it's a few page turns, but it's coming, right? Chapter 14 is the next thing coming. And remember, the book of Revelation was written in part to remind us that God is in control, even in the midst of great trials, even in the midst of the greatest trials. Right? It, it, of course, is a story about the end, but it's also about what's behind the veil, 
right? What's really going on behind the veil in this world that we see? There are these great, terrible battles, and there are these great and terrifying beasts, and there's this imagery that shocks the senses, but never once in the Revelation do we ever get the sense that God is not completely in control of everything that's happening. And the very same thing is true in your life today. It truly is, no matter how terrifying the beasts or the battles or the imagery, no matter how threatening this corrupt world system may increasingly become, God is still in control, we are still on the winning team, and he can still preserve us and protect us and he can still see us through and give us that new song to sing. And so we're encouraged by a text like this to continue in prayer and to continue in perseverance and to continue in patience through our trials. And all the time, God would have us to keep our eyes firmly fixed on that promised rest that will one day come to us. Amen? Amen. So Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for chapter 14, Lord, as that answer to chapter 13. And uh, I pray, Lord, for anyone this morning who is discouraged that you would use this text as a means to encourage them, Lord, in their spirits. Lord, that no matter how it seems that Satan may be having victory over areas of their life, Lord, I pray that they would be reminded that ultimately you will be victorious, Lord, that all of these things that seem so real and so threatening to us, Lord, truly are, um, are smoke and mirrors, Lord. It's, it's a house of cards that you will so easily cause to fall. And so, Lord, we thank you that we are on the winning team, and we thank you for the great encouragement that you give to us. And uh, we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's, uh, let's stand up and worship the Lord. Eh?